All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dennis, the Director of Industry Relations, uh, for those of you that don't know me. Um, today, uh, we have a, a full uh, evening for you that's uh, a mix of uh, different, a bit of a show and tell. So we're really proud of what the students have put together, but we also want to make sure that you get a sense of what the Masters of Digital Media program is all about, as well as the, the ways you can connect with us in the future, both through finding talent in interns and employees, to looking at uh, partnering with us on projects, or many other connections uh, that are possible. But I want to lead off the evening with uh, showing you uh, not just what I say about our program, but uh, what some of our past industry partners uh, have to say. So uh, this is the first reveal of uh, a latest and greatest from some of our industry friends. So here we go. Started working with the Centre for Digital Media a few years ago. I have collaborated with CBM on two projects. When the opportunity came up to uh, have a project with the students, um, we jumped at it. We became involved with the CBM program through our collaborative partners. I knew we were moving in towards some, some pretty elaborate interpretive uh, programs. With all their fresh ideas and um, all of this emerging technology. It's really great for that sort of ideation and the development of prototypes. You know, some of those things that may or may not you know, happen on the day-to-day -day side you know, of a company like ours. What really stands out was the team that was put together to tackle some of our interpretive plans. They got what it is that we wanted to do, extremely professional, extremely aware of uh, confidentialities at that time surrounding the property before it was being officially released to the public. We find that people are, are able to work and able to contribute um, you know, in a really positive way right from the beginning. And from the research side, the scientists also you know, find this a really refreshing experience to work with you know, such wonderful group of students. For any business that wants to prototype that wants to explore new ideas, new revenue sources. It's a great opportunity to work with an amazing team of students who are passionate in what they want to do. It's a remarkable group of, uh, of young men and women that have come together. We have a common goal to um, develop digital media tools and test them. We've hired a number of graduates. You know, one of the benefits from the program is that we get to know the students and they get to know us. Uh, so I think we have uh, eight or nine uh, graduates working with us here now. We've hired MDM students and we contract MDM students. And so that, again, speaks to the success of the program, that, that they come in with their ideas, but they also come in with really well-defined skill sets. The collaboration with CDM is actually very, um, very successful as far as, far as I'm concerned. And uh, make no mistake, they had some real challenges to, uh, to overcome. And they did, uh, they did so in an uh, appropriate, professional, and timely manner. And we're pretty excited about it. Absolutely, I would do another project with CDM, yes. It's a fantastic program to partner with. And, and they've aided our business in, in several different ways. And uh, yeah, it's certainly our intention to continue working with the CDM. And we'd like to say thank you to the entire uh, team and faculty at CDM. You guys are cool. <laughs> All right, we're cool. OK, I'll take that. Uh, so first up, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Richard Smith, the director of the master's program, to, to say a few welcoming re remarks. Thanks, Dennis. <clears throat> So I, I really have not very much to uh, take up your time this afternoon. I, we want to get to the, uh, the agenda, which is really to showcase the students. Um, this event, uh, like many such events, it would be completely impossible without an enormous amount of volunteer labor, the staff, the faculty members there's back there, and of course all the students have worked enormously hard, so I'm really grateful for that and very proud of uh, what, what they're uh, going to be showing you this afternoon, which is just really a subset of and a small part of what they've been doing this past year. I, um, <coughs> I've been here now four years and this is by far the biggest event I think in turnout and students that we have in projects. You can see, you'll see uh, the hangar is sort of 
everybody's in there very tight this time. It's uh, there's a lot of stuff going on now, and it's it's really really exciting to be here this year. And so I just wanted to uh, want to thank you here to for coming here. It feels kind of like being I don't know the dad at a wedding or something. It's just like ooh, I can't wait. And uh, <coughs> Um, I think one thing to, to look for, and you'll, you could see a bit of it in those videos, is that these students fr quite often are working really hard solving other people's problems, which is a, a big challenge when you're moving from a student life to a professional life, is to thinking about things from another person's perspective and how to solve those problems. And, and I encourage you to dig into that as you uh, have your conversations with them this afternoon. And uh, and basically, lastly, like maybe like me, you're the rest of you are sort of nerds and geeks and a bit shy, and hard, it's hard for you to start a conversation. So uh, we've asked one of our students to uh, come up and start that conversation for you, introduce herself and our program, and maybe you can uh, use it as a, a starting to uh, further conversations this afternoon. So Archana, thank you. Hi, my name is Archana, and I'm here today as a representative of my fellow students. We're a very interesting bunch. We're from all over the world. We speak 15 different languages, 16 if you count American English. And uh, we're also very diverse when it comes to our skill sets. We're artists, animators, programmers, managers, sound designers, and we're all here to do the Master of Digital Media program. So what is this program anyway? And how can a single program cater to the needs of such a diverse bunch of students? I'm going to try and answer those questions from an insider perspective. The first day that we got here, we were thrown into this insane melting pot of people. And the first thing we had to do was self-select teams and work on a 48-hour design jam with people whose names we barely knew. It was very stressful, and a lot of us fell completely out of our element. But that's the whole point. We put into this environment so that we learn how to cope. And we did. We figured out what each of us in the team did and how we did it. We figured out a common vocabulary, a common ground that we could all work on. And somehow, we got the job done. But for all that to happen and to happen well, we all needed to start taking one very important first step. We needed to start learning about ourselves. For example, I learned very quickly that to be a better project manager, I need to be more patient. What I'm trying to say is, we're all basically doing a master's in know thyself. First the I, then the us. But isn't that what's important to do well in the digital media industry? This industry is constantly changing. And if each of us are aware of our own strengths and weaknesses, and we understand the people that we're working with, then we're bound to be successful. All of us here have worked on at least seven different student projects in different teams, and it isn't so much about the output of the project, but the process itself. In short, the journey is the reward. I know I've made this place sound like a Buddhist monastery, <laughs> but um, I assure you we have a lot of fun here. Um, we learn, we teach, we build, we break. Sometimes, literally, we've worn out a few 3D printers. but. Um, <laughs> At the end of the day, we're better people for it, and we're better professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Archie. Uh, so with that, uh, we want to take you through a little bit of uh, the MDM journey here by showing you an example of one of the, the projects that the students tackled in their first term with us. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Team Exquisite Corpse. <laughs> everyone. Uh, we are really excited to be here today and sharing with you as the very kind of first team up here a project from our first semester. And the brief for this project was to consider a real world challenge and create a digital artifact that would solve it, including a narrative component. So as a group, we are artists, we're uh, designers, we're coders, 
Um, we are Omar, Juan, Joyce, Carolyn, and myself, I'm Paul. And uh, we, we really wanted to tackle a project that would allow us to think critically. We knew that we were gonna have industry projects further along in our time at the CDM, so we wanted to take this first opportunity to really try and experiment, do something a little different. When we started to think about common interests, we started to look around our space, and what we saw were little pieces of inspiration we were leaving behind for each other. Little drawings, little messages, things on the table, and it really got us thinking about the way that we share social content, and the way that we share it right now in a very familiar public way. We started thinking about, as a closed group of 54 people who are always at the school, very diverse group of people with unique thoughts and perspectives on our time here, how we could share that experience with each other, potentially in a private space, and a space that really reflects our time here. And so when we were reflecting upon kind of how we tend to use social media and these, and these type of tools, we thought about um, a challenging ourselves. Like what happens if you, if you uh, try and build something that's anonymous in nature and something that is temporal, that the stuff disappears over time? And as we're having this conversation, Juan uh, reminded us of this um, parlor game called uh, The Exquisite Corpse. And for those of you unfamiliar, exquisite corpse is something that's drawn on paper. You fold the paper in a certain way, so the first person starts drawing something and covers it up and passes it to a second, and they continue the drawing without seeing what the original had written, and it's passed around. At the end, when you open it up, you have a collaborative piece of art. And so we thought, how can we take that concept and transfer it into the digital space? And so one of the ways that we sought to do that was through a grid. The first kind of prototype we did was actually a paper prototype. So we took different pieces of paper and we cut them out to different sizes, put them on a whiteboard and placed them around the school and watched how people interacted with it. We had simple instructions to draw, destroy and repeat. And for three to four days, we left it in the space to see people create and collaborate with one another. And what we saw was a really positive response to the concept of the exquisite corpse and creating together on a grid. So the next challenge for us was to start thinking about how do we bring this into the digital world? And something that we really wanted to do was consider some of the digital technologies that are very kind of prevalent and interesting and, and popular right now. So some of the technologies that we thought to use, um, we had a pretty complex kind of timer system that used web sockets. We, uh, we used a, a fairly abstract database system using MongoDB. And we also really wanted to deliver using uh, augmented reality. However, as many of you may know, the challenges of augmented reality to get it really stable was, was a bit of a challenge for us. We really wanted to project a, a giant billboard outside the CDM that was invisible that you could only view through looking through your phone. In the end, we ended up abandoning it as the delivery method and just projecting it within the CDM itself. Uh, we would love to invite everyone here to actually participate in the Exquisite Corpse tonight as a reflection of your experience here and collaboration with each other in this space. So in order to do that, we're actually going to walk you through the back end a little bit so you can see how it works and also to show you a little bit of the thinking behind the build. So Joyce is just logging in right now. We have kind of a secret code to get in because it's designed for the 54 students here at school. Um, so the red square you see here is the one unlocked tile. So this is the starting point for the exquisite corpse. So if Joyce selects this square, she's then given a canvas to draw upon. So she can either draw or upload an image. She can scale the image if she wants. So she draws her image. And then when she submits it, oh, yep, don't forget the eyebrows. <laughs> she submits it. The adjacent tiles around that tile then unlock, allowing Joyce to then continue her drawing if she wants or inviting someone else anonymously to add to her drawing and then those subsequent tiles unlock and so on and so forth. If the corpse is left dormant for a period of time, then it all freezes up and a, one tile is randomly selected as a next starting point. So we're gonna show you a little video now of a time lapse of, of uh, the corpse at work over a period of time. So over the course of three to four months, we projected this experience out in the hallway and we opened it up for all 54 students to participate in. And what we saw was over 4,000 different unique images, pieces of content, little messages that we left for each other all throughout the day and night. It's really interesting to see how people started using it. The, initially, it started with a lot of imagery, but eventually it kind of transitions itself into a lot more drawing. And eventually people even started playing games on it. Um, it's just really interesting to see. And, and there were challenges in it. There were controversies because it was an anonymous thing. Um, but ultimately, it was a really interesting to see how people could actually use a grid of this nature to tell a story. So um, we would uh, we would really like to try it out or get you guys to try it out in the hangar so we have it set up for you. Um, on behalf of Omar, Juan, Joyce, Carolyn, and myself, Paul, 
Uh, we thank you for coming today. We look forward to talking to you more about uh, some of the projects we're involved in. We do some, we're kind of the non-gaming crew, so feel free to come and chat with us in the hangar. Thanks. Thank you, Team Exquisite Corps. So that was an example of one of the projects, uh, these students that join us in September, not knowing each other, not knowing each other's names, quickly bonding, figuring out how to draw on their skill sets and, and bring out the best in each other and lean on both the, the, those, the creative freedom that that brings as well as the production management, the time constraints, the documentation, all, all, everything really setting them up for uh, what you're about to see now. So in the second term, so from January until April, this is our, the, the term where many of our, well, all of our students tackle a real world challenge with a client. So tonight we've picked a few different examples of a variety of different uh, clients ranging from entertainment to museums to uh, you name it. You're going to see a, a, a taste of a little bit of everything because digital media is touching everything. And with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage our first uh, pro project team from our second semester, the Vancouver Maritime Museum. Hi everyone. My name is Eric, and I am part of the my, part of the my team from the Vancouver Maritime Museum. So the Vancouver Maritime Museum came to the CDM last term, and they gave us the opportunity to tell the story of the RCMP Saint Rock, uh, a very famous ship that was one of the first vessels to take the Northwest Passage into the Arctic. And what they wanted to do was create uh, an exhibit that was interactive, digital, and engaging and it basically had to tell the complete story of what the crew and the ship went through in this two-year journey. So we got together as a team and we started thinking, well, how can we tell a story so big and so vast with one single artifact? And then we came to the realization that in order to properly serve the story, we had to break it into two standalone digital artifacts. First off, the first part of the story we're gonna tell it using the wheelhouse experience, which was an actual built-to-scale replica of the wheelhouse in the St. Rock. So users can actually board the ship, drive it, and experience and feel what the crew went through in their passage. They would see animals, they would see water, and have also impending danger like crashing into ice. Secondly, we split the second, the second experience was a touchscreen experience, and it served uh, the story and the exhibit in two ways. The first one was, it would allow us to complement the narrative because the, the wheelhouse wouldn't allow us to know more than the actual drive it. So then the touchscreen will allow us to know how the crew lived, how they survived, what each part of the boat was. And it also finally helped uh, accessibility. Some people were not gonna be able to physically board the ship. I don't know if any, any of you have been to the museum, but also the ship has some areas that are not allowed for general public. So the touchscreen would allow you to actually experience the interior of these areas. So once we had all that figured out, there was only one more thing to do, and that was build the prototype. And Ryan's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Hi. Uh, so in order to meet the challenges of telling the story of the St. Rock, we turned to a number of hardware and software solutions. Most notably, though, while the, van while the wheelhouse experience isn't a game in the traditional sense, we still turn to a game platform to create it. So we built. Uh, the wheelhouse experience in the Unity game engine. And this allowed us to create a whole 360 virtual world that was in 3D and that was interactive so that it would give people a game-like experience even though we were trying to really teach them something. Um, and, you know, the, uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, it, wh while we're dealing with things digital here principally, we also managed to incorporate some physical real-world objects like an, an authentic ship's wheel and a telegraph that have been salvaged from old vessels. So we were really tying digital in with antique physical objects to make the best experience possible. Um, it, when the museum came to us, it, it, the written uh, description of the project imagined that we would just be creating the digital assets that someone else would eventually mount on screens after we had wrapped the project. 
But in the process of creating those digital assets, we begin to solve more and more of the hardware challenges involved, like you know the, the computer hardware, or how to control the ship, or audiovisual challenges like displaying on screens and installing a sound system. So before long, we had actually what we ended up with was a full-scale prototype that is very similar, we hope, to what the exhibit's going to look like in the museum. Um, and as you've heard here and, and elsewhere tonight, prototyping is actually a very big part of the program here at CDM. But I think we use this to particularly good effect in this project. Uh, we use prototyping in three main ways. The, the first was to sort of just visualize the environment we were developing for, uh, so that you know we were able to take the experience out of people's laptops and put it in a simulation of what the real exhibit was going to look like, and we, that allowed us to make for a much stronger uh, product. And the second thing we use prototyping for is to solve problems. So for us, some of the biggest questions around this were how fast should the ship move? How responsive should the steering be? How much resistance should be on the wheel? Uh, we were able to, by getting people into a, an actual physical replica of the experience, we were able to get answers to those questions you know, quicker and more effectively than we would have if we were just treating it simply as a digital product. And then lastly, we use prototyping just to sort of set mood. Uh, we wanted to create an environment where people could actually feel what the, uh, the exhibit would look like. And it, this had some neat effects. You know, it started to just sort of build excitement as the thing came together in higher and higher resolution. It, it built excitement here in CDM. But also, it built excitement you know, with, the, with the folks at the museum. Uh, the staff really enjoyed seeing it as it started to come together. They were getting a bit excited about that. But it also opened up the doors for them to have some conversations about it with people like their board of directors or some of their imp important patrons. So you know, one of the, as you've also heard, one of the guiding principles here at CDM is that we're looking to use technology to solve real world problems. So it was at that moment when we realized that our project was being used as a, in, in fundraising discussions that we realized that you know, we were on our way to solving more than one of the museum's real uh, challenges. So with that, that's our project. We definitely invite you all to come check us out in the hangar. Uh, you too can navigate the uh, Northwest Passage. We're kind of in the back corner, and you can steer the ship all you like. But then I would be remiss in not also inviting you to please come out and check out the Maritime Museum. They're over in kits, and you're invited at any time. But certainly at the end of next month, we are expecting to see two new digital exhibits uh, on display. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So uh, yeah, that was uh, one of the examples of the projects uh, from January. And it happens that uh, that project was very successful and that uh, we, we've continued to do a part two. So we have a current team working on uh, a project with the Maritime Museum as well. Uh, next up to the stage, I'd like to uh, bring up uh, the team that uh, worked with Work at Play. Uh, so uh, please welcome this team. Hi, everyone. So uh, as you said, so we are Team Revision. Uh, my name is Darren. Uh, that's L, Nilesh, Tiago, and Henry. So what are we going to talk to you about today? We're going to talk to you about uh, what we actually created, uh, which was a game. It's a top-down multiplayer game with a twist. It's actually utilizing two screens simultaneously. And uh, to give you a bit of a sense about how this game uh, is played, we're going to show you a little bit of a teaser trailer. So that's kind of a bit of a sense of how uh, one would play that game. Uh, but the client, as uh, you mentioned, work at play, uh, David Gratton, who's the CEO, uh, they're a digital marketing agency. And they actually tasked us with solving a specific problem with second screen games. 
And that problem was, could we manage our users' attention effectively? Uh, to give you a bit of a sense of the process and how we actually got to the solution, I'm going to hand it over to Tiago. All right, so how did we manage to create a second screen game that was at the same time fun and engaging and not frustrating? Well, uh, we went through an agile process and that was really fast. Uh, we had a developer, a really great one from Denmark called Tor. He helped us build nearly 50 iterations of our product and we got to test every single one of them in our daily basis. And we also did a lot of testing inside the cohort itself. So we set up the game here in the classroom. We got the, our classmates, the staff, anyone we could to play this game and experience our version of the second screen. And also, we had the freedom to experiment creatively, which means we were able to iterate of, over anything we wanted. We got to... Uh, improve our mechanics, we polished our graphics, we managed our balance in the way we wanted to and the way we were trying to. And that was really helpful for us and we wouldn't be able to do it otherwi otherwise without this, without a programmer. Uh, but we had a few challenges along the way. And the first one that came up for us was time. As Darren mentioned, David is a busy CEO, so we had to manage our time with him tightly. And we, so we had to set up every single meeting well in advance and make sure that everything was in progress and he was aware of it. Our second challenge was the unfamiliar mechanics, the second screen. And this was really challenging for us because we didn't know what it was. We even heard, it, heard of it very little until we got here. And this brought us another problem, which is complexity. And when you add a second screen to the game, you increase the cognitive load on the players. So we had to find a way to reduce the complexity of the game while making it fun and not making this, the second screen only a con as only a controller, but a, a device that you can actually see the events in the game and interact with it. So uh, what were solutions for this? First of all, we set up every single meeting where in, well in advance. We had a very direct communication with David and all our emails were exchanged almost daily. We sent him every single detail that we wanted. Our agenda was built collectively, so he was aware of our progress at all times. Also, um, since we were introducing this unfamiliar mechanic, we decided to do a lot of testing. And we did it both internally in our daily basis inside our team, and we also did it here in the classroom, we gather all the game developers, game designers, anyone that loves to play games to just give us the feedback. And that was extremely important for us. And the good part is that um, we ended up creating a tournament. And this tournament was only to see if people would have fun, and they actually did. So we 3D printed a trophy and created this a small little game here in the classroom. Jo our classmate Joey won. And in the end, everyone was cheering. Everyone was having the fun that we were expecting them to have. So it was really helpful for us, and everyone had a good time. We also had to got to present the game at Work at Play. We had the staff play our second screen game. They got to give us the, their feedback from their perspective, and they really helped us build the entire experience. So. Uh, we learned a couple of things over these 13 weeks with this project. And the first one was do your research. Learn what other companies did, what's their experience, and what's their intake in the second screen game. And we got to see what happened to them, like what, what they did and what kind of traps can we avoid when you're building in this kind of game with this kind of mechanic. Also, we learned that we had to plan our objectives clearly and early. And so we, have, we had an extra time to polish our idea, to make it better for everyone. So every single person in our team shared the same vision, so we all could move as fast as we could and produce as much as we could. And in the end, we learned how to play with users' attention between two screens. And that was the entire goal of this project. So we, we actually were able to manage the users' attention, making them looking up, making them look down whenever we wanted to. And that was through a lot of testing, a lot of, a lot of things happened during this project. In the end, we created a white paper and we delivered it to our client. So he has the references for future development. And we were really, really happy about this project.
So, uh, yes, we're really proud of the game that we created, and we'd like you all to have a chance to play it yourselves. So we have a little booth kind of set up um, in the hangar as well. And feel free to flag us down throughout the night or just uh, come by the booth and um, just see how it goes. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, guys. Uh, so now uh, we have another uh, project uh, example from the, the second term, also in the agency space, but uh, t tackling a different problem, uh, the world of marketing automation. So with that, I'd like to bring up the Elevator Strategy team. Hello everyone, we are Team Eagle Eye. I am Ling, I'm the video and audio designer for this project. And this is Camila, our project manager, and that is Jating, a UI and UX designer. And there's Alushi, our content manager. We have uh, another team member who is Chris, our developer. At the beginning of the year, Team Eagle Eye was brought up together to solve a real world problem. We worked with Elevator Strategy, which is an advertising agency to create new marketing automation solutions for their clients to Utah Canada. We started this project with identifying what problems existing in the current marketing automation solutions. Um, the current marketing automation solution is using software to send emails, check users' researching history, and pop up advertisements on social media pages. So the technology is existing, but isn't used creatively. Um, user disengagement is a consequence of the lack of creativity, which results in companies failing to share customizing information based on users' needs. So we did a lot of research, analysis, and brainstorming. We find that game process is one of the most effective way to engage and interact with users. Then we decided to create a gamify experience, this high riders. High Rider is an online interactive driving experience. It provides a personalized and engaging experience for users. And it also helped Toyota and the Toyota dealers in collecting user data, promoting car features, and converting leads in sales. Now I'm very excited to show you a video demo for our prototype. We open with an eye-catching video and a greeting to the user. At this point, we make the first ask and give the users a chance to share their email address. The user can choose the model of vehicle they're interested in taking out for a drive here. Users can also choose the color of the model that they would like. Once the user is happy with their exterior choices, we move to an interior view to give an idea of what sitting in the vehicle will actually feel like. Once the users decided where they'd like to take their vehicle for a spin, we put them back in the driver's seat of the same vehicle they just customized. Along with their drive through the city, users are challenged to manage their speed and fuel consumption by following recommended hybrid driving practices. There are three pre-selected stoplight locations where we take the opportunity to quiz users on their hybrid knowledge. We've put educational videos together to speak to three key hybrid teaching areas that were identified as priorities during our research. Acceleration versus conventional vehicles, how to use regenerative braking to your advantage, and how switching between gas and battery power is handled automatically by the vehicle. Getting questions right will yield bonus points towards the user's final score at the end of the journey. Great job, you have reached your destination. When the trip's finished, users are presented with a summary of how they did. When they continue, they're presented with our commute consumption calculator. The ask here is for their typical trip origin and destination locations, the immediate payoff for users is that they get a summary of typical fuel consumption rates and savings over a period of time. Users will also have the option of sharing their journey on popular social media channels. We really appreciate your time. Okay, so this is the prototype we built in these 30 weeks. During the process, we met some challenges. After we defined our solution, 
the first difficulty we faced was how to use it properly. Because it was not simply creating a game, we need to apply this gamification to marketing strategy. Thus, we used customer journey map to help us understand the story of user's experience and create a possible scenario that we can enhance their experience through our product. This is a typical car buyer journey. We analyzed it and we decided to use high riders in consideration stage to deliver our value to the users by detailed information about Toyota hybrid cars, as well as providing in, uh, interaction and engagement in this stage. The second thing was, because we are going to use this product as a tool to get the user data, so how to avoid making the user feel uncomfortable while, while we ask for their information becomes a challenge. So we did interviews and online surveys to figure out the best way to solve this problem. In the survey, um, we tried to determine a comfortable level of a user to share their information, like email address, and when it should occur during the game. As a result, we were happy to find out that the users are willing to give their email address at the beginning of the game, not just quit this game. These were the two main changes we met during the design process. Talking about the team dynamic, when we start working, we know we were right people because we are marketing experts, designers, and developers that having various skills to make this project completed. However, we had a part-time programmer, Chris, who can only be here two days a week, but we still got help from other programmers in this cohort which was a great collaboration in CDM. With all these challenges, we are happy to have this final product and had a great experience and learn a lot from this project. We would like to thank CDM and our client for giving us this opportunity to develop this product for their client Toyota. And we want to thank all guests here too, for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next up, uh, we have a, a team that uh, worked with one of the franchises that I'm a, a big fan of. So for any Reboot fans in the audience, uh, I'd like to bring up the team that is working with uh, Rainmaker Entertainment. Please come to the stage. <laughs> team Guardian. I know their team name. Team Guardian. Hey, my name is Lani Lu, and with me is my teammate, Carlos Strade. Last semester, we were working with our clients, Ringmaker Entertainment, Accenture, and Indigena on a project of developing a second screen experience for the new reboot show. But our, since our project is still under NDA, rather than talking about the product we made, we'd like to share the working process of the last six months with you. But first, let's begin with a video from our client. What was it that we were going to do and create and what we were going to end up with, I think, was an unknown in the start. And, and at the end of the day, you don't expect um, something that's necessarily tied around a school project to end up being um, something that becomes commercial viable. I think that really is a great attri uh, attributed to the team itself. The team was able to um, get my attention, and they got my attention by the great ideas they brought. Um, most of them from the industry um, who are passionate in what they want to do, um, have a goal of what they want to achieve, and the ability to align the goals of what we wanted to achieve as a company uh, with their goals and make them work through a project was fantastic. Uh, so they had a passion. It wasn't just about executing um, something for a, uh, a, a school program or a grade. It really was a passion about seeing this thing realized. The collaboration ideas that the team brought to the table um, just made it a really fun, um, fun project and I think uh, fantastic results at the end. Before we go any further, please let me introduce my teammates. Maddie, Alex, Jason, and Carlos, who I had great honor of learning from. Also, express our great thanks to our faculty advisor, Jeanette and Dave. 
I can still remember the excitement of the moment I got that one-page description of our project. We had really clear, clear goals to achieve. Develop a second screen experience to enhance the engagement of the audience. Make sure it appeals to kids. And also deliver a polished prototype at the end of the semester. But when we sat down and discussed with our client what exactly you want us to develop, we got an unexpected answer. They said, we can develop anything we want, anything. So suddenly, we got a world full of choices, and we had no idea what to choose. So immediately, we rushed back to our project room and started brainstorming. We were doing mind maps and lists and all kinds of research, and it was all very chaotic at the start. So we knew we had to set some structure around our brainstorming. So the first thing that we did was we didn't worry about how an idea would play out in the long run. We didn't worry about the scope of the idea or even really whether it made sense in a second screen experience or not. We, if we thought it sounded cool as a team, then we went with it. We wrote it down and moved on. Another thing we did was we looked at the skill set that we had on our team. A lot of us on the team really liked video games and we even had game industry experience on the team. So once we realized this, we really started focusing our brainstorming on games, and we started coming up with a lot more ideas that we enjoyed as a team, including the one that we went with through the duration of the term. So going into our second meeting with the client, we have all these ideas, but we're not sure which ones the client is going to like. So rather than just show them one idea and hope that they enjoy it, we showed our client three different ideas. And rather than just ask our client to pick their favorite, we asked them to tell us what they liked and disliked about each one. And the great thing about this was that we could really get into the mindset of our client as they talked through each idea, and we could begin to think like them so that in future brainstorming sessions, we could predict uh, before the client even saw the idea whether they would like it or not. So after the meeting, we started moving out of this ideation phase and into uh, more of the building phase. And uh, the thing about building in Agile is that things move quickly, like really quickly. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a danger that comes with working in a fast-paced environment like this, and one of them is that people will constantly be coming up with ideas that threaten to blow up your scope. So whenever a new idea came up like this, uh, we didn't actually worry about it. We took these new ideas as a challenge to see how far we could push our project. And I don't mean that we just stretched the scope every time we got a new idea, but we always looked at what bits and pieces we could take and implement into our existing scope, and if not, uh, how we could add these ideas into later iterations of the project. So because we had this open mentality about new ideas, but we also kept a strict hold on our scope and kept it manageable, we were ultimately able to over-deliver to our client at the end of the term. And what that meant was our client was really happy and they asked us to join them for another term of the project. So here we are in term two with a new team and a new set of skills ready to tackle a more focused look at our second screen experience. And the only reason that we have this opportunity in the first place is not because we avoided running into any challenges in term one, but because of how we handled those challenges once they were already there. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So we're on the home stretch of the presentations here, but I want to set up the stage for this uh, last and final presentation by mentioning that uh, the client for this last project was actually alumni uh, from, from this program, which is a proud moment for us. It's full circle of life now. We produce grads. They go off into industry, make their own companies, hire our grads, and ultimately, ultimately come back to us as a client. So yay, circle of life. Uh, so anyway, you may have noticed this box at the front here. They'll give you a little bit of context uh, to this and welcoming to the stage the last and final formal presentation of this part of the evening, Team Out of the Box. Thank you, Dennis. Wow, it's been a great afternoon. We've seen some amazing presentations. Like, oh, it's been impressive. <laughs> So, hello everyone. We are team out of the box. And this is what we developed in our last term. So, I'll introduce my team first. Uh, 
I'm Gandhar Tannu. I'm the product manager for this team. Uh, here is Jessica, who worked in client handling and concept development. We have Omar, who worked as project manager and programmer for the project. We have Marcelo, who was a technical artist. Joey, who worked as character artist. And Wei, who was the programmer. So the task that we were assigned with was uh, to create a digital artifact that could best demonstrate features of Hollis. So what's the features of this amazing device that we see over here? As you can see, it's a three-dimensional display, so people can interact, it, uh, interact with the device from all the four directions. Then another important thing is it's built to bring people together while interacting with the box. So a lot of times we are interacting with screens and we are just kind of drawn away from the real world. And so this box allows multiple users to look towards each other while interacting with the box. Uh, so to showcase these features, we thought about a lot of ideas. We rapidly prototyped a lot of ideas amongst them. And we finally singled down of the, on the idea of creating a holographic home assistant. And here's a short video about this, uh, the assistant that we developed. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the first ever Holo Assistant on Earth. Let me show you an hypothetic situation of a future case scenario of a family using Holos. Hey Yomi, do I have anything important for today? Today, we have scheduled to plan the food and drinks. Could you check grocery deals online? I have checked and there is a 10% discount in beef and pork at Safeway. Create a shared list and send that to Monica and me. I will email you a list of deals and a list of groceries to your app right now. So this is the assistant that we created. We only had seven weeks to build this idea. And uh, some of the technical features of this assistant is uh, it has voice recognition and synthesis built inside it. Then it's Internet of Things ready. So users can just send in commands, and then they can control their house appliances. Then uh, it has multiple productivity apps integrated inside it, uh, such as calendars and reminders, allowing family members to work collaboratively to do their groceries or just cleaning their house. Uh, then another thing that we wanted to focus from this assistant is we just didn't want an assistant that's all about work. We wanted to create an assistant that also entertains family members. So we created an assistant that has a personality of its own. It sends in jokes, uh, it plays music, uh, it, it entertains during the parties by dancing. And <laughs> so we have a bunch of things that we've implemented. So what were the design decisions? Why did we build what we built? Uh, first and foremost, we wanted to create an assistant that's approachable. So if this box is to be placed in the houses, so there would be kids and seniors ranging in different ages interacting with the assistant. So we wanted to create an assistant that could appeal everyone. Second thing uh, that we wanted, uh, we implemented uh, by this assistant is, uh, since Hollis is a new product, we needed to create a product or an assistant that could appeal the early adopters. So once we think of holography, we think of Star Wars. So we made this assistant look a bit like R2-D2. So it, it kind of triggers that uh, sense of nostalgia in people. Uh, the third point, uh, uh, the third important design decision that our team took is we wanted the assistant easy for future teams to develop. And uh, that's why uh, we, have, we had a few project like deliverables. Uh, the first deliverable that we gave to our client was a fully documented and well-structured Unity project. Along with the Unity project, uh, we gave an elaborate documentation, which included roadmap for future developers to build on the idea. Uh, we not just created an assistant, but we've also created an IP. Uh, in the documentation, we have written down the background story, the world about the character, so that in the future, if H plus technologies decide to 
build a game or an app revolving, or even merchandise revolving around the character, they could build on top of it. And finally, the most rewarding part of the project, success. Uh, we were very lucky in this department. Like, we're glad that our client really liked the product that we, del uh, we delivered to them. Uh, so much so that our project has been mentioned in H plus uh, in Hollis' latest Kickstarter campaign. Um, they've been having an amazing Kickstarter campaign. Just go check it out. Uh, and on top of it, they also invited us to present uh, Omi, or the assistant that we developed, on their Kickstarter launch party. And this was a very rewarding experience, a proud experience for us as a team. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening to me. And I hope you guys have a great evening. Come meet us. We have our assistant and Hollis in our booth. And we would be happy to answer any questions or suggestions you guys have for us. Thank you. Thanks, Kandar. All right, so uh, yeah, we're in the home stretch now, and I know there's uh, some fantastic things awaiting for us uh, in the building next door. But with that, because this is a, a student event, I do want to bring up a student rep to give you some context as to what's next and what, what to expect from these guys. So please welcome David to the stage. Good afternoon. In behalf of the cohort, I want to say thank you for coming here today. It looks like a full house, and we're really excited about it. Um, we also, I also want to say that what you have seen right now is a demonstration of what happens when a set of multicultural students come to Canada and solve real-world problems for, for, for things that matter to people. And uh, what we have built, you're going to see here today, and the processes that we have been through are very important, and as Archana has said, are part of the journey and is the most important part. But it is now time for you to experience the things we have built. So we're very glad to show them to you in the building next door, it's called The Hangar. Um, the gorgeous lady called uh, Janet is gonna be in the door right there. She's waving at me. Hey, Janet. Sup? So, gorgeous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you if you follow her, you'll go to the hangar, and there you can have fun with some of the things that you have built, games, uh, experiences, and any digital artifacts that you might find interesting and might be very fun to play with. So, see you there. Thank you so much. Oh, and remember, there's a barbecue, and there's and there's drinks. So, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, so uh, as the man said, the door's opening to the back, the bar is open, the barbecue is there. Uh, any questions that come up about these projects or students, seek me out or any of the faculty in this building. Thank you again, and we'll see you in the hangar. <laughs>